<laughs> Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Kazney. I'm a conservation director serving Southeast Nebraska for the AmeriCorps Common Ground Program. The Common Ground Program holds educational webinars and events or about conservation issues such as water quality and conservation, clean energy, and soil health. We focus on educating the public and preserving Nebraska's natural legacy. A couple items before we start. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those in the Q&A option or the chat box below. And make sure to direct them to all panelists and attendees. You will also be asked to fill out a quick survey once the webinar ends um, and you exit. We would love for you to complete the survey as it helps us measure our outreach and is used for grant reporting purposes so we can continue doing events like this. Uh, today, we are joined by Jerry Steinauer. Jerry is a state botanist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission for the past 30 years. During this time, he has worked with multiple organizations to restore grassland and woodland ecosystems through long-term restoration projects. He has also written landscape, landscape management documents for use by wildlife management areas, as well as articles for Nebraska Land Magazine. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for speaking with us today. Well, thanks, Laura. Uh, good evening, everybody. Tonight, I am going to talk about some of our Oak Woodland Management Indian Cave. Uh, a lot of be about prescribed fire. Um, you can't just jump in with questions, I've been told. So save your questions till the end. Um, we've been uh, working at Indian Cave doing prescribed fire for probably about 12 years now. We've had some really good results using prescribed fire in uh, Nebraska oak woodlands was kind of a, a new thing when we got started. Uh, states to the east of us, Iowa, Missouri, Minnesota had been doing it, but it was kind of a new concept. A few people had done a few fires in oak woodlands, but it was a real learning process for us for over the last decade, but it, it's worked out pretty good. Ah. Having a technical problem. Uh, there we go. So where are oak woodlands in Nebraska? Um, the red on this map, this is Bob Call's pre-settlement vegetation in Nebraska map. The red along the Missouri River are oak woodlands. Um, they've come up. The Missouri River migrated from the southeast United States post-glacial times. They go out a little ways on the plat, up the loops. Uh, scattered throughout southeast Nebraska and an extension actually goes out to the central Niobrara. You have oak woodlands and canyons on the south side of the Niobrara all the way to nearly Valentine. And that's where they stop in eastern Nebraska. So this is an extension, a western extension of a the great eastern deciduous forest. But I'm going to back up in time that these are not an old plant community in Nebraska. We just came out of a glacial cycle with glaciers 14,000 years ago. There was glaciers, mile of ice in southeast South Dakota. And Nebraska was a totally different ecosystem and very cold climate. We, this shot is actually of the Russian uh, tundra, but this is what Nebraska looked like. We had spruce forests and northern grasslands. We had mass ma mammoths running around, woolly rhinos. The deciduous forests have moved in since the glaciers retreated. And so this is where 14,000 years ago, the Wisconsin glacier stopped. Previous glaciers had gone farther into Nebraska, but this is what I wanna really show you, this climate trend. You know, 14,000 years ago, it was really cold too cold for deciduous forests in Nebraska. We've had great warming. About eight to 5,000 years ago, there was a mega drought in Nebraska. Super drought. The Nebraska sand hills look like the Sahara Desert. And if it was that hot, deciduous forests probably did not do well in Eastern Nebraska at the time. They were probably pretty shrunken back, probably on the lowest north facing slopes the coolest canyons. So I go over this just to show you how these plant communities have changed greatly over the last 12,000 years in Nebraska. They are 
being affected by the glaciers. They are not old ecosystems. You know, in the southeast the United States, the deciduous forest survived through the whole Pleistocene gl glaciation for 2.5 million years ago intact, but it, it was not so in Nebraska. They are a recent community. So where is Indian Cave State Park? Down in southeast Nebraska in uh, Richardson and uh, who do, geez, I'm drawing a blank, Nemaha County. It is roughly 3,000 acres inside in size and probably 2,400 acres are actually deciduous woodland or oak woodland. And um, we concentrated our management there, starting with oak woodlands because we had managers that were really agreeable to it. We had some grant dollars. Um, so as a perfect place to start, we have kind of expanded this oak woodland management to some Ponca State Park, uh, Rock Creek Station State Park, private land, some WMAs. But uh, the dominant trees down at Indian Cave now, we have four common species of oak, burr, red, black, chinkapin, basswood, two hickories, bitternut, and shagbark. Black walnut, elms, and hackberries are common. Um, we are out on the dry plains. If you went to Eastern Missouri, you would have a far greater diversity of deciduous forest trees in those woodlands, as well as understory plants. As I said, we've got species that migrated this far in the last 10,000 years. Um, it's too dry for a lot of the species, a little too hot. So um, our forests are rich, but not the richest. And as you go north in Nebraska, trees start to drop out. It gets too dry. You know, by the time you get to uh, Niobrara, Nebraska, the only oak left along the Missouri River is burr oak. The others have all dropped out. There's no hickory up there. So the Great Plains are just too dry for a lot of these species. So can you see this or is my screen in the way? This is a painting by Carl Bodmer who came up the Missouri River in a flat boat with Prince Maximilian from Germany in 1813. And he was an oil painter. His, uh, a lot of his paint, uh, Jocelyn has his whole collection, but this is a shot of Missouri River just south of Plattsmouth. Notice the deciduous forests are on the steep north facing bluff. The west facing bluff is mainly open prairie, kind of savanna with scattered oaks. North facing slopes are a lot cooler east facing slopes, I mean, and north facing slopes. Prairie fires probably came in from the west. Now we go to Indian Cave State Park and deciduous forests cover the whole bluffs. They've become kind of a homogenous, thick stands of woodlands. And the reason for that is that we have taken the prairie fires out of the system that kept the woodlands open uh, kept prairie on a lot of those Missouri River bluffs. This is a quote by a, a Jones. I don't even know Jones's first name in 1838. Annual conflagrations which pass over all the prairies and barrens in the West. He's saying they burned about every year of those prairies. This is a night shot of the woodlands burning at Indian Cave. This is a prescribed fire. Um, who were the fire starters? Well, in the West, when a lot of wildfires start, Colorado, Idaho, it's, it's lightning. But it, it's a different story in the prairies. It was Native Americans who set the majority of wildfires. If you think of prairie, uh, lightning strikes, they're mainly in June and July. They're usually associated with rain in the Great Plains. So if a fire got started, there's a good chance the falling rain would put it out. In the mountains, uh, the lightning strikes pine trees, they start to smolder, the fire might even not drop down to the ground till the next day. So the Native Americans were the fire starters. They burned for numerous reasons. They burned around their villages, just to get rid of thick gra grass thatch, though it's uh, less chance of wildfires. They burned to keep the woodlands open uh, for berry production, for hunting. 
Uh, they were big eaters of acorns, and some ecologists even theorized they were managing for oak woodlands for the acorn production. So they were managing oak woodlands as a food source. Uh, a lot of fires just escaped from their campgrounds and started. Um, this is a woodland savanna burn at uh, Rock Glen W. May in Jefferson County and a quote from Dockery in 1855, in the timber, there was absolutely no brush. The trees were very massive and the ground underneath was covered with prairie grass. He's describing an oak savanna and savannas are open oak woodlands that are very fire prone systems. They evolved with fire. They have a grassy prairie understory because the fires go through them so often. So this is more of an oak savanna at Rock Glen in Southeast Nebraska that we were burning as part of a game in parks burn. So what problems has the lack of fire caused? So with settlement throughout the West, um, you know, the Native Americans were gone as fire starters. Uh, the ground got fragmented from farm ground. Uh, settlers did not burn the woodlands. And these oak woodlands, evolved for eons with fire in the system. They're a very fire adapted system. You take fire out of the system, just like the pine forest in the West and it causes problems. So the shot on the upper left is a site in South Central Iowa, Iowa called Timber Hill Savanna owned by a, a couple named the Browns. They've been burning this site for 25 years, did a little tree thinning and they've opened this woodland up very greatly. Went down there and they showed us the neighbors and this is their neighbor's ground. And they said, that's what it looked like when we started. And this is what a lot of our deciduous oak woodlands look like in Nebraska, very dense trees now, very thick sub canopy. Trees like ash, hackberry, elms and dogwoods they are very fire sensitive. They don't have the thick bark of, as oak to protect them from fire. And in a fire system, they do not do well. Well, we took the fire out of the system and they went ballistic in our woodlands. Dense, dense shade. Um, just through this, we are not trying, you know, some of our bottom lands at Indian Cave are very mesic woodlands with big elms, big basswood. And those are naturally kind of non-oak forest. And we're not trying to convert those all back to oak woodlands. Then we have these big north and east slopes that are, have these huge big red oak and black oaks that had a pretty open understory. And then on the hilltops, west and south facing slopes, we had the open grasslandy savannas, which are basically gone now. This type of red black oak is full of hackberry into the understory. These denser forests are doing all right because they never, they never burned real well. They were always so, so wet and damp. So one problem, we have a lot of soil erosion. There's so much shade. These are all little hackberry trees that have come in post fire suppression. There's so much shade that there's very little ground vegetation and you get a heavy rain. This is a lot of times very loose soil. You can have soil erosion, which is a problem. Just notice the lack of vegetation in this slide due to heavy shading. Um, oaks. Oaks are very sun loving species. Their seedlings and saplings need sun. Um, they can do with about 60% canopy closure above them. That's enough sunlight to get them to maturity. But a lot of our forests are 100% canopy closure. There's just not enough sunlight to get these oaks to grow. So as our large oaks are dying, they are not being replaced because these saplings, we have very few two foot tall oaks or at least when we started at Indian Cave. We have a lot of little six inch seedlings, but they can't grow beyond that height because there's not enough sunlight. They are used to being in open woodlands to mature. So this is an old oak that died. Our fire kind of put the last kabonk on it. 
and we need to replace those trees. We don't want just hackberries and elms and ash coming in. 50 years, we may not have any oaks left unless we open up those woodlands. And there's a lot of oak dependent wildlife that live in oak woodlands and that are dependent on oaks. Um, the number of mushroom species that are dependent on oaks is pretty amazing, but the southern flying squirrel, they eat acorns. They have to glide between trees. You can't glide between a tree when the forest is crowded. In a year of good acorn mast, where there's a lot of acorns at Indian Cave, the woodpeckers just overwinter there like crazy. They come there for the acorns. It's a major overwintering food source. If we don't have oak woodlands in the future, where are they going to overwinter? Uh, the rare timber rattlesnake in eastern Nebraska, Indian Cave, still has a small population, but they grow or they live in open oak woodlands. Um, they don't like overly dense, super shady woodlands because they like to sun themselves in the fall and um, they need to warm up outside the hibernaciums in after winter and kind of sunshine. Don't have that in really dense woodlands. Plant species, there's a lot of plant species that are, they aren't prairie species. They don't like open total 100% sunlight. They aren't forest species that like dense canopy. They are species that do good under moderate sunlight, speckled sunlight. They are adapted to savanna open oak woodland ecosystems. They don't grow anywhere else. Purple milkweed, uh, yellow lady slippered orchid in Nebraska, the shrub Iowa crab apple, you always see it on the woodland edge. I only know about five of these prairie crab apples left at Indian Cave. There's probably more. There's some, a nice patch on one of the neighbors. You know, another reason we're burning is because of non-native species that have come in since settlement that we've learned that fire helps control some of these species, uh, especially garlic mustard, which is a biennial that you can see how thick it gets and it can just crowd out the native plants. Um, we bring these plants over from Europe, Japan. They don't have any of their native pests or diseases. We don't bring those along so they can kind of just run wild in this country. Two shrubs that are horticultural shrubs that have spread from plantings, uh, a mere honeysuckle and buckthorn are pretty bad in some of our native woodlands. Fire doesn't really help as much with these, they just respout, but uh, Cerecia lespediza and garlic mustard, they help us, They fire helps us control those. This is just to show you how thick a mere honeysuckle can get if it's not controlled. Um, there's the woodlands down by Plattsmouth on the Missouri River Bluffs that actually looks like this. Um, super expensive. You can see how no native plants could grow under there, how oaks could not regenerate. You couldn't deer hunt in those woodlands. You can't mushroom hunt. It's just an ecological disaster. And, and that's what we're trying to avoid at Indian Cave and other sites. Um, I could talk about how you control that, but that's kind of another topic. Um, recreation. Um, Sometimes some of the woods at Indian Cave, not all, but they were getting so thick with down logs, so many small trees that it was actually hard to walk through them. Difficult for, you know, people come from Kansas and Missouri to hunt morel mushrooms at Indian Cave. Um, and mushrooms, these mushrooms actually do a lot better in open canopy, sunny woodlands. So we've actually improved things for mushroom hunters. We have bow hunting and muzzle loading deer hunting at Indian Cave and having open oak woodlands that you can actually see the deer is better for hunters. And just hiking in general, there's gonna be more wildflowers for people to see, um, more animal diversity. So we're doing it for recreation also. Okay, now I'm actually gonna to get to the fire. Uh, as you can see, these are not outrageous wildfires. They aren't even as wild as a prairie prescribed burn because you're, you're 
litter, your fuel is oak leaves, fallen oak leaves. So we burn in the fall and winter. The, do you ever notice a burr oak leaf? They're thick, leathery. What's that all about? Well, they're designed to burn and carry fire. The whole tree is adapted to a fire ecosystem. You compare that to a basswood or an elm leaf, elm leaf they're uh, very thin, they get wet, they stay wet. It, it's, it's really hard to burn a basswood forest. They're not designed to burn, but oaks are uh, self-promoting fire. So our burn units at Indian Cave, we started rather small and then we said, well, it's actually just as easy and a lot of times safer to burn a big area as a small area. Um, the orange lines are hiking trails and um, the black line is a blacktop road. This is Missouri River. So this unit is pretty easy to burn. We've got a blacktop road all around it in Missouri River. Uh, the fire could jump this line, but it, it's, it's hard for it to do. So we have a pretty safe unit. This south unit, we've actually added this part to it. So it's over a thousand acres. This last fall in two burns, we burned this whole area. Um, this one's a little tricky because we have a neighbor to the south and there's just a little trail between us. So we have to be really careful the fire doesn't escape to the south. So we only burn this unit when we have like three days of a south wind. So last fall, we burned all this area and this area. Um, if we had the good days, we probably would have burned more. If we get a good day this spring, we'll probably try to burn this area right down here. So our fire breaks, this is the road. We also use our hiking trails. What we'll do in the morning, if we have a hiking trail or the day before is we have a really high powered leaf backpack leaf blower and we just go blow the tree, the trail free of leaves. So that's a good enough break. In our big problem at Indian Cave, we have so many hiking trails that the, the trails stop the fire. So we have to come in and relight on the other side. So this is a drip torch, has a combination of gasoline and diesel fuel. It drips down to a little pad. You light the pad uh, and fire drips out the end of it. So that's how we light them using a drip torch, um, fireproof um, pants and shirt. This person's kind of extreme. We don't wear the goggles or the helmet. This was a, a nature conservancy person helping us and they have to go all out, deck out. They even have a fire tent strapped to their belt, which we don't use as, as game and parks employees. They have a radio. It's nice to maintain contact on a burn, but they're, they're setting the fire. So our burn window, when can we burn these oak woodlands? Um, late October after the leaf drops through late March. We burned in December, January, February, March, late October, the last five years, to be honest, we usually don't get leaf fall until early November. And I, I blame it on climate change, to be honest. And the oak leaves have to be dry. If it rains even two tenths of an inch, we've got to wait a week till those leaves dry out again. Um, they stay wet. And with a, you know, not in open sunlight, they're still dried, dead or branches up above. They take a long time. Um, so we don't get a lot of good burn days. If we get three days, four days in the fall where we can burn in and cave, we think we're doing pretty good. Fall fires are often hotter because the leaves are nice and spread out. They've not been compacted by snow. Um, they're fluffy, they burn hotter. Um, in winter, a lot of times the leaves get blown around. There's big bare spots that get blown into canyons. So I, I prefer fall fires because they're a little more consistent, a little more hotter than spring fires. But going back, you know, by March or first of April, enough of the uh, ground layer vegetation, the grasses and the sedges are greening up. It's wetter. You just cannot burn those woodlands anymore come April 1st. 
So burn prescription, you know, you need temperatures above 40 ish. Um, I love burning when it's, you know, a fall day, 60 or 70 degrees, that's perfect. But they will burn when the temperature's 40. The lower the humidity, the better. Um, the humidity's gotta be below about 40% or there's just those leaves soak up so much moisture that it's hard to get them to burn. Humidity about 20%, they'll really burn and crackle. Um, we like winds about 20 to 25 because Indian Cave is so hilly that trees and hills just stifle the wind and you need a wind to carry that fire through the woodlands. Uh, without a wind, they'll just burn so slow, you can't get them to burn on a lot of slope. So the wind's moving the fire, bringing oxygen to the fire. So what we really look for is high temps, low humidity, and a pretty good wind. You know, we probably won't burn when the wind's 35, uh, can blow burning leaves across trails, across the road. So, and you get so few burn days that if we look and it's Tuesday and we say, man, we can burn on Thursday, we drop whatever we're doing and go and burn because you just don't get that many burn days to burn oak woodlands. Prairies, if the prairie gets rained on, a lot of times it'll be dry enough the next morning you can go out and burn it just because it's getting wind and sun, but it's different in an oak woodland. So you got to start early. Days are pretty short. Some of these burn units, this is our 700 acre burn unit. Here's a fire line. They move pretty slow. You've got to get, you know, we've got three or four miles of perimeter alone on this to start. And a lot of it, we just drive that road with the drip torch on a four wheeler and light right off the drip, or right off the four wheeler. We've got shooting ranges, odd houses we have to burn around first, uh, some picnic shelters out here. You can't dink around on these burns because you have short days, you got to get it all lit. And so we move pretty fast. A lot of people always want to volunteer and it, it, it really doesn't do us that good because our crew, we kind of move too fast for people. And um, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, it just kind of slows us down. Um, so after the burn, um, things happen, dead trees start to burn. Um, they'll burn for days, they might burn for a week. Um, if they're not close to a fire break, we don't worry about them. They'll just burn out. Um, our problem is if they, these dead trees, it's amazing how fast the fire will move up those trees. And we did not burn on the other side of the road. So we're using one of our pumper units to try to put that out or else we have to cut those trees down. If they're laying, you know, if you go out here at night and the wind's blowing, sparks are just flying off this thing. And it's pretty cool actually. And they'll probably go this far. So we worry about those sparks going across the road. So anything near a fire break, we try to cut down or put out the burning snags after the fire. If that tree's laying on the ground and burning, it's not going to spark across or very rarely. So we don't worry about that. Um, a lot of times the burns are patchy. This is, this is kind of an east slope. Not a lot of oak leaves. It might have been a little moist. You can see the fire burned through here, but it didn't burn here. It didn't burn over here. Another one where the burn moved pretty through patchy. You know, a lot of times with prairie burns, people worry about burning the whole thing because certain insects may be hibernating in the leaf litter or in the dead vegetation. So we don't really worry about that in any case because there's always slopes that don't burn or patches that don't burn. Um, like it says, sometimes only 60%. Sometimes when it's really dry and we have a nice wind, uh, we'll get more like 90% of the area will burn. Um, tree mortality. Um, let's look at this slide first. This is a unit that we burn probably every three or four years. 
these are trees that we are kind of trying to thin out. They're non-oaks, they're probably ash and some elm in there. This, the, this area has probably been burned four, four times and you could see what's happening. Even though the fire is only six inches or a foot tall, it's damaging the bark on the lower part of all these trees. Bing, there, 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 every one of them. Eventually it's gonna kill them, but it takes a lot of fires. So we're looking, this one actually has already died and fallen over. So multiple fires are affecting those trees, which we think is a good thing. This is a big chink of an oak. And you can see this fire burned really hot. This was a spring fire. This canyon had filled with leaves blown in from the wind. <coughs> I lit this fire at the bottom of the canyon and it just roared up with about four or five five foot flames. This is one you would not want to have been on this slope when it was lit. Do you think this killed this tree? Nah, this tree is fine today. It got its spark scorched on the outside, but it's still alive. And this was eight, nine years ago when this happened. What these really hot fires do though is help us, they kill a lot of the lower branches which helps get uh, sunlight in. This is a black oak that we did kill. This was a February burn when the humidity, and it was really dry that February, that the bark was so dried, it basically just burned the bark off. And this was only on one hillside, just a couple of these black oaks, but it was kind of under extreme condition. So mainly these oaks with this thick bark, these fires do not even phase them, such as this chinkapin was not phased. Another thing we, if you were at Indian Cave 10 years ago, the amount of uh, dogwood we had, which is a fire sensitive tree, it was just so thick. So what's happening here is a previous fire blackened these and killed these top, top stems, but it re-sprouted the next year. And you never want to just burn a woodland once. You have to, once you start, you need to keep burning it because what these things do is re-sprout. So you've got to burn them several years, not always in a row to kill these re-sprouts too. So we'd probably burn this, kill these sprouts. It'd probably sprout back another time, but eventually it plays out the root system. But if you just burn once and left it, you'd probably have more dogwood stems and a worse problem than if you never burned it. So yeah, once you start, you've got to keep burning. Um, sometimes fire is not enough. You know, these forests have been left alone for 130 years without fire. They've got a lot of shade tolerant, fire intolerant, hackberries, elms in there. Some are so big that they're not really impacted by our fires that much. So we thought in areas we'd go in and start mechanically removing some of the non-oaks. So this is just a couple acre area we did about 15 years ago. Well, it's a lot of work, chainsawing down trees, cutting them into pieces, and it doesn't look very nice. We get a lot of visitors at the park. So, we only did about three acres of this. And then we learned of a new technique that was being used in other states to the east called hack and squirt tree thinning. It's a method where you use herbicide. Uh, and the cat's meow is Garlon 3A mixed with arsenal. It kills every tree. And what you do is you just walk through the woods with a little hatchet and a squirt bottle full of herbicide. You make a little whack and a couple wax in the tree. There's one, there's one. A tree this size, we'd make about three wax and squirt a little herbicide in there. In a couple weeks, they start to die, start to turn brown. Um, we've done trees up to 10 to 12 inches at Indian Cave, and it really speeds up opening the oak woodlands. You know, we're not killing oaks, we're not killing basswood, we're not killing big hackberries, we're just killing what we call the weedy trees. You can see how dense these woodlands are with 
ironwood, you know, nothing's gonna grow underneath them. It's a very inexpensive, fast method. We can do an acre in about an hour and a half, two hours. Um, contractors will do it for 150 bucks an acre. If they had to go in and cut those trees down, it'd cost you a thousand dollars an acre at least. Um, the trees die standing and fall in a couple of years. Um, this is a uh, autumn olive that is dying from being hacked and squirted. Doesn't have many leaves left. It will be dead the next year. The good thing, um, the chemicals we use do not transport from root to root to other trees. They stay in the roots. If you would use a chemical like Tordon, it can transfer you know, if roots or a uh, oak tree was in close proximity to the uh, hackberry roots, they could transfer over and kill the oak, but the chemicals we use do not do that. So these are the species we're mainly treating with hack and squirt. These last three are non-native species. So results of our fire and thinning. Uh, let's start here. This is a steep slope. Prairie Ridge Top, you know, this was one of those first slides that in the old days, it was probably all prairie. There still was a sliver of prairie on top. Basically, just through fire, these are all little chinkapin oaks. They're surviving the fire, but the whole understory is now prairie. There's lead plant, all the warm season grasses. It looks way better than when we started. This slope was thick woodlands. We hack and squirted. You can see that some of the dead standing trees that we hack and squirted. Other hack and squirted trees are laying on the ground. This is a south slope. It burns hot. These are oaks that are still living. This is probably more natural tree densities, but prairie plants are starting to come in this understory. It's still kind of weedy, but we've really opened up that slope. You know, to us, this is a great result. Um, there's kind of, we learned from the Browns in Iowa, and this is Mrs. Brown right there in the middle. This is back in Lyon, Iowa that I talked about. It's been burned for 25 years. The first response when you're burning, you do get some, they're native plants, but they're kind of weedy sunflowers, hog peanut. They like that recent burning. They kind of flush when you first start burning. You can just see all the sunflowers that are not flowering yet. Then the second stage, all your grasses and your sedges start to send up seedlings. Think of that ironwood stand that I showed you earlier. It starts filling in. There's no bare soil, there's no erosion. So what's this do for moisture? When you have a lot of bare soil, you get rain, it just washes off. Or if you have a lot of leaf litter accumulated, it flows on top of the leaves. <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're putting vegetation back on the soil surface. This will catch rain, more rain will percolate. It's a wetter ecosystem. It will stimulate all the soil fungi, all the mushroom mycelium that are in those soils. They start producing more nutrients for the plants. So you're changing the whole soil system. Also more sunlight's hitting that soil. It's getting warmer. You have warmer, wetter soil and it just flushes with bacteria, fungi, nematodes and the vegetation loves it. So you're actually, we're actually impacting the water cycle also. So then the Browns will tell you, well, the third stage, you know, and we're just really getting into this in any cave, all your conservative wildfires, wildflowers start coming back. We're seeing lots of pale prairie and plantain, this huge past of bastard toad flax, which I had never seen it in any cave, just popped up, saw it one year. We're getting more purple milkweed, all the savanna plants. So we're starting to see that vegetative response. <clears throat> Overall, this is a chinkapin stand on a south slope. 
little chinkments here that were there. Just good ground cover, wildflowers. It's just a totally more natural ecosystem today than it was 10 years ago. And not all the park looks like this good, but you know, this problem was 130 years in the making and it's gonna take decades to reverse. So a lot of the parks looking a lot better and we have a lot of work to do yet. I wanna go back to the Timber Hill Savannah, that 220 acre site in Iowa. The Browns were really good botanists and they're really good with mushrooms too. So all the year, over the years, they've been tracking the plants and mushrooms on their property. 25 years ago, they had 100 species of vascular plants, prairie plants and woodland plants on their 220 acres. Now they have 425 species. They did not recede anything. Those plants were still in those oak woodlands as seeds, or little leaflets that were very stunted. It's botanically, it's the neatest site I've ever seen. Uh, Yellow lady slipper came back. They are the only known site that they know of that has the rare red poured bolete mushroom, only place in North America. So that is telling you that that fire is doing something. Their overall mushroom diversity is probably out of this world. Uh, I just don't have figures on how many species they have now. But it just tells you that this whole ecosystem evolved you know, probably post glaciation, post glaciers, oak woodlands were in the Midwest. After the glaciers, the Native Americans were there. They were burning them for 13,000 years. These species are all adapted to a very open system with a lot of sunlight. Just look at this slide, all the sunlight penetrating those woodlands at Timber Hill. How thick the vegetation is. The whole system's adapted to fire. Some really, these are a little technical. If you're a little bit of a science nerd, Dan Day at Missouri has written some great publications summarizing the oak literature, uh, restoration of oak savannas and woodlands. Really good publications, both available online. Um, this is my last slide. So I'll just, if we have any questions, I'll just leave this up while we go through the questions. All right, thank you again, Gary, for speaking with us today. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, please type those out in the Q&A option below um, or in the chat, either one works. We do have one so far. Um, it's, is black locust a problem in that area? No, black locust, we have a few black locusts in Indian Cave, but it is, you know, black locust is a native of the southeast United States that was brought up here, and it, it can be pretty invasive in a lot of prairies and areas, but it is not one of the problem trees at Indian Cave. And then if you could just go a bit more into what the hack and squirt mix is. Well, if you're really interested, um, I would talk send me an email or uh, Crystal Lang. Uh, you probably should have a little instructions, but it's, we use Garlon 3A as a water soluble herbicide. And I think it is 25% Garlon 3A in water and 3% arsenal. And you do not have to squirt, just fill that little hack. When you make that hack in this tree, you need to have a little flange coming out that you can squirt that herbicide so it sits in that flange. And you don't need a lot, but um, you kind of got to know how many hacks to make on each tree. You know, I think it's like our general formula for, for each two inches in diameter chest height, we make three hacks around the tree. But it, it's a great method. Um, if I owned oak woodlands, I would be doing it on my own private property. And there's this, there's this hatchet, it's from, it's not expensive, it's a Swedish hatchet, but our people in Indian Cave swear by it and never need sharpening, it's nice and light. So just um, my 
email is just my name, jerry.steinauer at nebraska.gov. And that is in the chat for anybody who needs it as well. Yeah, if you're serious about Hack and Sport, just email me and I'll put you in touch with our people in Indian Cave. They're kind of the experts on it. And then are there any concerns for using the hack and squirt near a water source? No, it's, we're using such, I mean, the amount of herbicide we're using on a tree is so little, you know, but what we're doing, it, we're putting it right into the cambium, which is taking it down to the root system. No, I, um, I'm not concerned about it. It's not affecting any trees around it. Uh, you know, may a little may get into the ground, but you know, it, it's a decision of maybe having a little herbicide in the ecosystem or or losing the whole ecosystem. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what we face. We probably get. 10 times as much herbicide from agricultural drift from farms next to Indian Cave than anything we're doing. Makes sense. Uh, how many people are usually involved on a burn day? Well, at Indian Cave, um, you know, this is after years of experience and working together, we'll, we'll burn with, you know, we did those 300 acre burns with maybe seven people. Um, if you're just beginning, I would have more and experienced people. Um, sometimes if we burn bigger, we'll go with 10, 12 people. You know, it all depends on conditions, how windy it is, how dry it is, what's next to the burn. Is there a chance it can escape? Uh, each fire is different and needs a different amount of people. doesn't feel like a lot. Um, do you have any input or ideas ideas for obtaining assistance for burning on private property? Say that again, please. Sorry about that. Uh, do you have any input or ideas for obtaining assistance for burning on private property? Well, that's always a good question. Um, one thing, if a person's interested in burning, there's a lot of uh, burn workshops these days. A lot are put on by Pheasants Forever to attend those. And I would go and watch people burn. In parts of the state, there are prescribed burn associations, which are private landowners that get together, that have a burn boss and help each other burn their properties. Um, you know, you can look to see if your area has one of those. I know there's one for Lancaster County and Saline County, I believe. But, you know, you know, burning something you don't want to just jump into because it can be very dangerous. Um, it's good to have somebody with experience be there when you first start burning too. Um, it's, it's just something you're going to, you know, we have Game and Parks has district private lands biologists throughout the state. And if you're really interested in burning your property, I would call those, you know, they're in Norfolk. We have an office, Lincoln, Kearney, Bassett, that that would probably be the best place to start is to talk to some of the Game and Parks private lands biologists or Pheasants Forever have farm bill biologists throughout the state to, you know, just Google, get their phone numbers. and. A discussion with them would probably be the best thing, the way to start if you're really interested in burning your property. And then, sorry, we have a lot of questions. Oh um, my gosh. I got to be in bed so, by 9.30, so. I think we'll make it till then. All right. Um, so back in 2019, uh, did that have any big impacts on the burnings with the floods? The floods? Yeah. Um, not really at Indian Cave. Um, 
we do not burn the floodplain. We have so we have a little bit of cottonwood forest and Indian cave, but all of our oak woodlands are in the bluffs. It's a it's a bluff ecosystem. In the old days, there used to be some burr oak woodlands and other deciduous woodlands in the floodplain. But these were big trees. They were they were all cut for lumber. They were all cut down for cropland. Um, it's hard to find. There's one little burr oak woodland up by Ponca State Park. That's about the only one I know of. They're just gone. I mean, the Missouri, whole Missouri Valley was very cut over, ag dominated. So no, we don't have any, we don't burn in the woodland down there. And that's the only place the flood, plain, flood really affected. And then personally, what was the best win in the habitat work that you have done at the park? The best win? Oh, one night we were playing cribbage and I beat Chance really bad at cribbage. So, <laughs> no. Um, just overall, I think the way, um, you know, Park visitors could have shut us down. They could have complained and complained and complained that how these woodlands are black this winter. There's been a few complainers, but just the way the park visitors have accepted the burning is probably the biggest thing that has helped us, just the way the public has responded. You know, the public can shut down a lot of things. Um, and if enough people would have complained, you know, maybe our parks people would have said, ah, no. But the public has accepted it really well. That's good. That's always good. Uh, and then we have one that wants to connect uh, what we do here for prescribed burns to the forest fires in California and other states. Um, it's kind of on a bigger scale, but would that help alleviate the situation seen there? Prescribed fire help out west? Oh my gosh, yeah, that's a huge issue. And you know, the difference between our woodlands and those western forests are like night and day. There are a totally highly more flammable ecosystem. Um, pine woods with pine needles, uh, super flammable. You know, our fires are nothing compared to their wildfires. Um, yeah, their problem is, you know, 150 years of fire suppression, needle layers four inches thick, super dense trees that allow all these small trees um, have a ladder effect they burn, get into the tall canopy. You know, their huge problem is that they have housing so many places that doing prescribed burns becomes hard because you've got to worry about burning down these houses scattered or the forests. it can be done. It's going to take a lot of money and involvement, but you know, and, and there's the issue when one prescribed fire gets away and causes some damage, people will complain and complain. So, you know, the forest service has to worry about that, but they need prescribed fire. You know, they, and the same thing in the Pine Ridge of Nebraska, you know, you can do tree thinning, but you have a hundred years of needle accumulation, not a hundred years, but you have a duff layer of needles that thick that, you know, when those fires starts, that whole needle layer burns and smolders for days and days, and it heats up the soil, and a lot of the trees are killed that way because the roots just get so hot. Mm -hmm. So prescribed fire, is definitely needed out west super bad on a huge scale that, you know, if they can pull it off. Huge scale. Um, yes. Okay, so back to Nebraska. Do you have any problems with Japanese bittersweet? I believe no, that's a tree. There are problems I've heard about it becoming around Omaha getting bad in some of those woodlands, but we do not see it yet at Indian Cave or at Ponca State Park, not that it won't get there, not that we don't have a lot of 
exotic plants we're dealing with already. Uh, what other tree species are common in the oak savanna? Um, and then they also asked for a rough percentage of the makeup. Of oak savanna? Mm -hmm. um, you know, bur oak is your most fire tolerant and drought tolerant of the oaks. And that's followed by chinkapin oak down in by Indian Cave. So those two would be very prominent. Um, you know, you could have some hickories, uh, black walnut, lesser amounts. Savannas are usually oaks, but you know, some of the hickories, shag bark's pretty fire tolerant. Black walnut's a pretty fire tolerant tree. What you wouldn't have are the really thin bark trees, like elms are pretty thin barked, hackberries thin barked. Um, you know, those thicker bark, those four or five would probably be the most common savanna trees. You know, black and red oak also at Indian Cave. Okay. And then we have one from Tom. Uh, he works for an organization that does very little active management of their forests. Uh, do you have any recommendation recommendations for planting the seed with higher up administration regarding the benefits? Uh, well, you know, we work, uh, Krista Lang and Chance Brueggemann who both work at Indian Cave Forest in the Woodlands. You know, they're working with other groups like uh, Arbor Day Foundation. We're trying to get some woodland management started on their property in Nebraska City. We're working with, Krista's working with, geez, five or six scout camps that are burning now and thinning. Um, I would, two things, I would have somebody, from Gaiman Parks, me or Krista or Chance, come talk to them. Uh, come look at Indian Cave. You know, if your administrators are leery, um, you know, you've got to show them something. They probably don't understand what the problem is because honestly, a lot of people will, you know, any, or, Fontenelle Forest is a great example. They had terrible problems and now they're burning and thinning. But most visitors and some of their administrators would walk through their woodlands and they just think, oh, this is a natural woodland. They, you know, it's hard for people to understand what they should look like, what the issues are. You know, to a lot of people, a tree is just a tree. And if you walk through a forest that's crowded with nothing but hackberries and ironwood, it probably looks not much different than a forest with nice oaks with a luscious understory. So it's trying to explain to them what the problem is and, and showing them sites where management is going on is, is always helpful. You know, we've had private landowners come and watch some of our burns at Indian Cave and, you know, we're doing, helping some of the bait neighbors on some several hundred acres of woodland. They've seen our burns at Indian Cave and they think, I wanna do that. And they're mainly have the property for recreation deer hunting. So showing them an area, having somebody from a conservation agency come and talk with them is probably the best start. For your fires, do you have a certain goal for the fire return rate? that you strive with for within your, sorry, that you strive for within your prescriptions uh, or is it variable depending on what's the best to do under available conditions? Yeah. Um, Missouri Conservation Department has done a lot of burning. They've done it for a lot of years and some of their oak woodlands like in their parks are really good. And, the guy who managed those parks told me that they shoot for a three-year fire return interval just because after three years, shrub starts coming back. And, you know, we're not really in that stage. I think we're at Indian Cave more in a restoration stage yet. You know, we haven't got our tree densities to what we want them yet. Our goal right now is to burn as often as we can and as much as we can, but I could see us in the future going to a 
three, you know, maybe 20 years down the road, a three or four year burn rotation. But, you know, I'm even with grasslands, I never like to say, all right, we're going to burn it every three years. You kind of like to mix things up when it comes to natural area management. You know, don't burn it every three years, burn it maybe sometimes every two years, sometimes every four years, you know. So I would think eventually we would shoot for three or four years at any cave, but right now it's, we need all the fire we can get to get rid of the shade tolerant trees. Okay, and another one from Mike, he's going off of what you just said. Um, did you start with burning every year for seven years or how was the beginning of the burns? Let me go back to a slide for Mike. Because it's been really variable. We're kind of doing a little experiment. Um, this unit is easy to burn with the river and the blacktop. We burned it 11 years in a row. This last winter, we did not burn it. So it's been burned annually for 11 years. This area, like I said, we need specific winds. It's harder unit to burn. We've probably burned this whole unit three times in the last 10 years. This unit, maybe five times. This unit, four or five times. This unit combines with the neighbors. And this is the guy that wants to burn. We burn this once. So we have a pretty variable fire. You know, these have all been burn different amounts of time and a lot of it's just ease of burning. Um, practicality. If we could, I'd burn it stuff more, but we just can't pull the burn off, burns off because of lack of good burn days. And do you follow the fires with any seedings or do you just use what's in the seed bank? No, we, we don't. Um, the, the, if I was in an indication, the stuff will come back on its own. And we're seeing this. Um, there's a plant called pale gentian that uh, was last seen in Odo County, Nebraska in 1938 in a wet meadow. We've had five patches show up at Indian Cave. It's, it's, and I know it's due to our management. You know, those things survive as seeds. Um, Turk's cap lily is, you know, there were patches there, but we're seeing more. Um, there's a fern that Chance found two patches of that had never been before found in Nebraska before, but in the last two years, he's found two patches of that fern. And I don't know if it's our management or it's just moving in, but things are coming back. A couple of our hilltop prairies that weren't very diverse, we collected seed from other local prairies in Southeast Nebraska, and we've been throwing it out. Uh, this area right by the entryway is was a horse pasture and it was pretty beat up, but it's got some oaks and it had been seeded to warm season grasses. We've had thrown a lot of prairie seed back into that area. So no, we are not reseeding our oak woodlands at all. Just some prairie areas in the park. Do you anticipate a similar vegetation response to this type of low intensity fire in ponderosa pine woodlands? Well, it's a whole different system. Um, if you could do prescribed burns, um, you know, in some of our WMAs, if we pull off a prescribed burn every 15 years in our ponderosa pine, that's pretty good. You will get increased plant diversity in the understory you will get, you know, the problem with a lot of those pines, they get thick, they get a thick pine duff and it gets sparse vegetation underneath the pines with a lot of Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome because they like that shady thick duff. You will get a good understory plant response in the pine woodlands. 
Um, you don't need to burn those as frequently as we burn these deciduous forests. Um, there's probably less species naturally in the ground layer of the pine woodland, so it may not, it's going to be nothing like the browns where they went from 100 to 400 species. Uh, you know, maybe you're talking increase of tens of species in, under those pine trees. Um, sorry. Did bison, uh, did bison historically graze the oak savannas? Uh, and if so, did they play a role in keeping some of the brush under control? Well, if, if you think about this area at Indian Cave, it's right along the Missouri River. It had fairly high densities of Native Americans living in this region because of the resources of the river, the river, river Valley Oak Woodlands. The bison if they were in this part of Nebraska, were probably pretty sparse because they avoided the Native Americans. If Native Americans were not here and more highly settled along the Missouri River, they they may be um, more in those woodlands. I'll tell you what: the Niobrara Valley Preserve has some oak woodlands up by Valentine. It's a uh, nature conservancy, and they have the bison pasture goes right down into the river valley. So the bison have access to the oak woodlands. And what they do is, you know, these oak woodlands have a lot of sedge species, which green up early in the spring, that those bison, not in big groups, but they will go down and graze those sedges in the spring. In those oak woodlands because they're green before the prairie vegetation is greening up. So that would probably be the biggest impact is they probably would have, you know, if Native Americans weren't here, I'm sure there would have been bison, denser bison concentrations in those oaks. And they probably would have probably gone in in the spring when the sedges were nice and green, the greenest forage around is as they do on the Niobrara Valley Preserve. But it, it's not dense, dense grazing in those woodlands, but they do get some bison grazing. Elk would have been there and were there. Deer, of course. Do you know any bird population studies done, on, done at Indian Cave? Um, and if there's been an increase in species since the burning began? Well, I didn't cover that topic because I didn't want to get too scientific, but we have really, um, a pretty intense bird monitoring system going at, I'm going to see if I got a slide of it, at Indian Cave in Ponca State Park. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. And it's been in place for probably eight years, uh, point counts, but it's not showing it is showing, we read the plots again last year, and it's showing some increases actually in some bird species, but no real decreases. This slide is showing, you know, some species prefer dense woodlands, very shade, very shrubby. Some species like more open woodlands. And you would expect, what the research has shown is that overall bird diversity increases with oak woodland management, you may get some decrease in some of these species, but overall you're gonna get an increase in abundance and diversity. Um, we may in 20 years have less Kentucky warblers, I don't know, or oven birds, but I look at it, you know, a lot of those north slopes are mainly basswood, um, in elms and they don't burn and we are really not opening those up and we will be leaving habitat for these densely wooded species there may not be as that like dense woodlands there may not be as much but I don't think we're going to eliminate them at all and overall for wildlife insects birds I think we're going to do really good things which every other research study in the eastern United States is pretty well shown but we have very 
intense monitoring going on for birds at both parks. We're also doing this type of management at Ponca, but not to the extreme. Uh, are our Southeast woodlands similar to Missouri's? They are fairly similar, um, but Missouri, as I said, has a greater tree density, more extensive woodlands, more ground layer plants. When you come into Nebraska, um, right on the Kansas border is a, a woodland called Rulo Bluffs, and it's probably our most diverse woodland. And even going to Indian Cave, you probably have a few less plant species that it gets too dry for. As you get to Omaha, um, black oaks stop there. Chicken pen don't go past Omaha. A lot of the understory plants don't. And as you get farther out on the Platte, Missouri, uh, species really start dropping out. Missouri's wetter than Nebraska. They have more extensive and more diverse deciduous woodlands than us. Far more oak species, far more hickory species, far more of some of the ground layer groups. Very much richer diverse woodlands because it's wetter. They've also probably been there longer too, more time. We have two questions left. Um, from Larry, uh, where do you think you're at with the restoration efforts? So like, at what point do you feel you're, you'll be in maintenance regime and do you have any target metrics to define that? Well, a lot of the foresters from the East, Missouri, Dan Day will tell you that if you want oak regeneration, you need to get your canopy density down to 60%, 40%, no tree canopy that sunlight can come through. We're not there yet. Um, some places are better than others at the park, some aren't. It's too dense yet. I'd say, you know, what we have to do is start taking out some of the bigger canopy trees, like some of the big hackberries to really open things up. Not in all the places, some places, some of the south slopes are really open already because the fires burn so hot. Larry, I would say before we're at somewhere, some of the Missouri parks are at, we probably got another decade, two, maybe three. Um, we started later. Um, we got a ways to go. And as and you know, some people say, when are you going to stop burning? Well, these woodlands always burned. Um, you've always got to manage. It's just like a prairie woodlands. You've got to continually manage them. We're not going to ever stop burning, hopefully. All right. And then the last question is just um, from David. He's wondering if there's a copy of the slide deck available. Of the slides? Yes. Well, if I could somehow get them to you. <laughs> you recorded this, right? Yes. Yep. It's being recorded. And the the video will also be up on conser the Conservation Nebraska website. Um, I believe it's just one second. Sorry, I should have had this up. But yeah, so, it will be on our conservation. Nebraska website. Thank you, Amanda. So yeah, it will, you can view it there again if you want to share it with anybody or. Perfect. Um, that is all the questions for today. As of now, feel free to keep, keep sending them in. Um, Again, once this webinar ends, the survey will open up on your web browser. Please complete that. It would be really helpful to us um, and it will be used for grant reporting. And just overall, thank you guys for joining us. All right, thanks everybody. Go home and enjoy the rest of your Friday night.